Fun. So we are doing our first chapter in uh, Joel. I was going to race on with our introduction, so we only did half our introduction last last week, but Steve objected, so we'll go <laughs> we'll go straight into the first chapter. So we're just going to we're going to do the first chapter in two parts. Uh, so Joel, uh, we are going to read from uh, verse one to twelve. Who wants to read that? We will read, and who wants to pray? I pray. Carlos, I saw that hint. You're up. So, when first, and then Carlos. Joel, the word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Shephuel. Hear this, you elders. Give ear, all inhabitants of the land. Has such a thing happened in your days, or in the days of your fathers? Tell your children of it, and let your children tell their children, and their children to another generation. What the cutting locusts left, the swarming locusts have eaten. What the swarming locusts left, the hopping locust has eaten. And what the hopping locusts left, the destroying locust has eaten. Awake, you drunkards, and weep and wail, all you drinkers of wine, because of the sweet wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. For a nation has come against my land, powerful and beyond number. Its teeth are lion's teeth, and it has the fangs of a lioness. It has laid waste my vine and splintered my fig tree. It has stripped off their bark and thrown it down. Their branches are made white. Lament like a virgin wearing sackcloth for the bridegroom of her youth. The grain offering and the drink offering are cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests mourn the ministers of the Lord. The fields are destroyed, the grounds mourn because the grain, the grain is destroyed. The wine dries up, the oil languishes. Be ashamed, O tillers of the soil. Wail, O vine dressers, for the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the field has perished. The vine dries up, the fig tree languishes, pomegranate, palm and apple, all the trees of the field are dried up, and gladness dries up from the children of man. Colors. Oh dear Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity that we have to come together before you. Thank you so much for the way the Holy Spirit is, is abiding in us and showing us a way, which is through your word, so that we can open your, um, our understanding to understand the scriptures as they will be highlighted by Mark as we have this beautiful meeting. We just pray that we can open our understanding so that we can put into practice these wonderful teachings that we are following based on your word and your love. And we just thank you for the opportunity to be here together, praising you and thanking you through the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Well, a special welcome to the first comers and a congratulations to Sam and Matt. He got baptized today. It was great to be a part of that. So, uh, moving on. Uh, for the guys who were here last week, we'll do a quick recap. So who remembers? Uh, what did we discuss last week? Why are we in the book? What's the book about? What is the critical point? So Steve, uh, you're usually pretty well, it's, quick it's off the... Repentance and judgment Yep. the main theme uh, in times. Uh, seems like it's future uh, tense, from what we're talking about here. Yep. Um, what else are we talking about? So just to yeah. um, come back on that, yeah. so it's um, uh, judgment, yeah. leading repentance, yeah. but the critical point of the book is what? So we have a classic structure, remember we talked about the chiasm? Yeah. So the critical point is res restoration. Oh yeah. So it's judgment, fine. judgment brings about uh, repentance. Repentance results in restoration. So the whole point and purpose of the book, the whole point and purpose of tribulation of any kind, is salvation. So tribulation resulting in salvation. So God is always seeking the save, always seeking the save. That's a critical point. When looking at any of the, uh, particularly um, um, the prophetic literature, uh, where God's coming in, he's threatening to, to judge, etc. The, the idea is the, the, the threat of judgment is to avoid. So God would, would hope that they would respond, uh, that they would repent, and he would relent. Uh, but as we know through, throughout history, through scripture, 
Uh, that's not often the case. Okay. Usually, I think the, the exception there would be with the fishy uh, book. Uh, jo yeah. uh, Jonah. Jonah, Jonah, right? What happened? Say Nineveh, right? They repented. <laughs> so, and what happened? So the fishy book, yeah. The fishy book. yeah I, I say it's fishy because it's not eschatological, so there's something fishy about it. No. <laughs> <laughs> so the fishy book, uh, Jonah, so, so uh, the Ninevites say that they repented and Jonah got upset. Because he didn't want them to repent, he wanted them to perish, and uh, but who who knows what happened in Nineveh? Got destroyed. Oh, they, no, 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 they uh, saved thirty years. Mm -hmm. uh, revival. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. initially, initially there was. Oh, a eventually they, they so, were so, destroyed. And what big, what book picks that up? What's the follow on from Jonah? You know, no. <laughs> Name. Name. Yeah. So so about a hundred, hundred and twenty odd years later. Uh, they reverted back to their sin and they were completely destroyed. They completely wiped out. I think the Yeah, so God, yeah. So, so, it's so, so yeah, it's, yeah, it was the instrument of destruction, yeah. of judgment, but essentially it was God, right? So God did to them some yeah. hundred years later what he said he was going to do through Jonah. So 40 days, repented, up the that. Yeah. Right. So they did, they did respond. So they repented and God relented. Uh, but so that is the um, that's the aim. So all all judgment, so the threat of judgment, the purpose of judgment, or the threat of judgment, is to bring people to repentance. That then um, um, God would relent, and then essentially they would be restored. So the critical point in the book of um, Joel is exactly that. So that is a, within the chiastic structure. That is a critical point: restoration. So God is seeking to restore. Now we know through. Um, with, by reading the book of Joel, and of course we know the follow through. Uh, the book of Revelation, as you rightly said, it's it's um, it's eschatological, so it's pointing towards um, an end judgment. But it's not just eschatological; it's 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 actual. So there is a, the literal happening, and then there is the um, predicted or um, um, prophesied event to come. So in the latter days, as um, Joel will talk about later. Uh, there is there is something more to take place over and above the literal. But what Joel does here is he uses the literal, the, ha the, the, the event that's taking place at the time, to be able to sort of forecast the next. So one foreshadows the other. Anything else from last week? That's it? We hopped around a lot. We, 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 yeah. I'm trying to remember. <laughs> where, where did we say? Where did we say that um, in, in relation to the date, the timeline of Joel? Yeah, where did we say? Four, which means what? Post captivity uh, time of Persian just coming into the Greek period. So it's yeah. probably the time of Esther around that time. What's the um, so? Who would be um, Joel's contemporary? Uh, Name them. Oh, actually, uh, Malachi. Malachi. Yeah, yeah Malachi. 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 We'd yeah. be the closest. Yeah, okay. yeah. If, if, if that's the case, so we put it the latter, and that's where we we would from chapter three, because chapter three is critical and related. Talks about the grief. Talks about so it's, it's um so it's after the temple has been destroyed. So you wouldn't put it at the at the form where a lot of people put the, the at the, the front end, which is alongside of say um, Amos, Amos and Isaiah, but uh, the temple is still standing. So. For those been, reasons, we have been restored. Though. It's about 400, 400 rebuilt. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's talking about the destruction of the temple. So yeah. chapter three talks about the destruction of the temple. Yeah, yeah. So the temple was destroyed once in mm. seventy AD, wasn't yeah. it? Well, that was the fire. Yeah, yeah. So it's, so it's obviously it's not there. So, this point been rebuilt so essentially, so what we'd say, and that being the case, and we're not going to, you know, draw swords on it, but yeah. uh, essentially, um, Jonah would be the last voice alongside Malachi. For how long? 480 odd years. 400 years, yeah. It's called the, the years of silence. Mm -hmm. So what, why? Well, it's a time between Testaments, but as I said last week, Daniel 11 sort of goes through a fair bit of what happened during the Greek Seleucids and the Ptolemies. But it was, so it, there wasn't a, God wasn't really, there wasn't a prophet during that time. Why? Are you asking why there was silence? Why? There was no silence. There was, why? there was no prophetic. Yeah, but why wasn't there a prophet? Um... Well, apostasy, man. Yeah, maybe. essentially, essentially, um, God's people stopped, stopped, they stopped listening to God, yeah. so God stopped talking to them. Mm. Until who? 
He was the next. John, John Baptist. Baptist. Yeah, so he was, but he's still an Old Testament prophet, right? Mm. Yeah, so he was the next, and he then was pointing to Christ. So Malachi, so the critical point of Malachi, uh, talks about the messenger to come. The messenger is John the Baptist, who points to Jesus Christ. What does Jesus Christ do? Restore. Restore. So yeah. reconciliation, right? So restoration, that's the critical point. And you'll find it's the case within most of the books. God is always seeking to say, which is, um, you know, you would say that was Jesus' mission statement. So where would we find that? You know, Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. Luke, chapter 19, verse 10. So if, you, if, if Jesus had a mission statement, that would have to be it, that Jesus came to seek and save the lost. And you're going to see that all the way through the Bible, specifically in the book of Revelation. A lot of people don't like the book of Revelation because it's controversial or it's, uh, it's too confronting or you know it's all sort of doom and gloom and etc. But it's not, actually. It's, uh, the book of Revelation is where we'll see the greatest revival ever take place in the history of mankind. Uh, there, there is great... Um, tribulation, of course, tribulation, trial, and, and um, um, testing, same word, same Greek word, but it's for the purpose of salvation. So you're going to see masses, uh, numbers, more than anyone can number, come to faith in Christ Jesus in the tribulation. And a lot of people will be people who have had an encounter with, uh, maybe in a church upbringing or an encounter with God, this side of the tribulation, but because they, um, they were lukewarm, they were loose and liberal, they'll find themselves in tribulation having another opportunity. So again, the grace of God is extended to all and everyone, uh, regardless of who you are, where you're from, what you've done, how long you've been doing it for, or who, long you, or who you've been doing it with, God's grace is extended to everyone in that time for the purpose of salvation, but it will be quite, um, um, mm. quite terrifying. We're going to read something of it in this uh, letter here. So straight away... Uh, the letter um, is obviously it's, it's about judgment. Uh, so in, in the second part of this um, chapter here, we're going to see in chapter uh, say chapter one, say thirteen through to twenty, it's a call of repentance. So that's a dead giveaway, right? So you've got the threat of judgment in the first section, and then you've got the call to repentance in the, in the next, and it will continue along those lines. And of course, we also see in uh, chapter two, uh, remember we said last week that. Uh, some Bibles will treat the book of Joel a little bit differently. So some Bibles have three chapters, some have four. Mm -hmm. So we remember which one, how it was broken up in, in some Bibles. So the Catholic Bible treats it differently, but also the, uh, not the you know, that one, but um, the uh, American Standard uh, Version Revised treats it differently also. That has four chapters. So there's, what's the, what's the difference? Something Who remembers? the day of the Lord, I think. Well, the day of the Lord is mentioned many times, or um, say four or five times um, within um, Joel. To remember which book in the Old Testament has um, uh, mentions the day of the Lord more times than any other. Zechariah. Zechariah. Yeah, yeah. So there's some 21 references, um, some direct, some indirect. But Zechariah is chief in reference to the day of the Lord. Or well, all of the um, the um, major and minor prophets reference the day of the Lord, uh, bar one. Which one would that be? The fishy one. Yeah. <laughs> the fishy one. All right. So yes, the only book that doesn't mention the day of the Lord. So um, are we missing information, or they just expanded it and changed its chapters? Exactly the same. They just treat they just treat one chapter yeah. slightly different. So it's not different. like an NIV thing where we're missing no, a no. couple of. No, no. Where does it start? Because I remember we did this last week, and what they actually yeah. did was it was one of the books was basically split in half. Um, yeah, kind of. Yeah. So it's um, you don't remember? Eighteen or chapters? Um, I thought it was like. All right. It's it's two, it's twenty eight. Chapter two. Yeah, you 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 collide, you're on it. Yeah, you're on it. Yeah. To so, say so two twenty eight. See, um, chapter two. In um, some versions, there's only, there's only a few, we're, we're four chapters, um, the, the American Standard Version of Revised in particular. Um, so you see chapter uh, 2, verse 28 to the end, that's treated as a third chapter. And then what, where we've got the third chapter here, uh, continuing to the close, that's treated as a fourth chapter. So it's interesting, and you can see why they do it. I mean, we're talking about restoration. So these are very familiar verses um, to most of us. 28 to um, 
uh, what have we got? 31, 20, 31. Who wants to? 32. 32. Is it 32 there? Oh, there is. No, there is 32. So who wants to um, speak into that? What, what, why are these verses so familiar to us? Oh, we talked about that last week. It was uh, in Acts, I think, uh, it was brought up. Yeah, Acts. Chapter 2. Chapter 2. So, so again, we're talking about... Uh, the book's prophetic, right? What do we say about prophecy in relation to, say, the way the Hebrews treat prophecy? Different to the way some Greeks treat it. And the more pattern. Like, it's happened before, it's going to happen again, but it's like, it's a type of, it's like a parallel, parallel or a pattern where the Greek is more cause and effect, where the, group, the Hebrew is usually found an event happened which foreshadows the future event. So it's like pattern and prophecy. They and and we've, we've specifically, mm. it's, um, the Greeks would say, oh, um, it was prophesied there, uh, it was fulfilled here, therefore it's fulfilled. The Hebrews won't necessarily. It's a it's a it's yeah, yeah, that's such a continuation of. So it can, it can be a, 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 a part fulfilling, yeah. and then a continuous a continuation of, which is what we see here. So we see this uh, this reference. Uh, so who wants to just quickly read it? So uh, 28 to 32. I'll read it, if you don't mind this stage. <laughs> and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaidens in those days will I pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered for in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. All right, so then Peter quotes this in Acts chapter 2. So you've got the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and uh, you know, he preaches, the multitudes, what was it, 3,000 um, come to faith in Christ. They say, Sue, what do we do to get saved? And he says, uh, Repent and get baptized. <laughs> and uh, so. Was this um, passage then? Because uh, Peter says, "Oh, this is that which Joel said." So was the, was this prophecy then fulfilled in Peter's time? He stopped at thirty one, though. Peter. He didn't, well, he, no, he, he because thirty two. He he talked. He still talked about the um, you know the, what's going on in the cosmos. Yeah, yeah but he stopped at thirty. He didn't really mention two thirty two. So he stopped at. He stopped at Acts. He stopped at the. And he didn't, stopped. And he didn't stopped and didn't didn't stop fulfill, yeah, so he doesn't quite fulfil. Yeah, so he didn't say it last. Well, he it's it's, it's it's incorporated into a sermon anyway. But but specifically, oh, you're talking about the cosmos. Yeah, yeah, I thought he was just he actually said, um, what you're seeing is what was prophet uh, what was yeah prophesied by mm. the prophet yeah. John. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's so. right. So it was a passage. So it was a prophecy rather. Was it fulfilled? Partial. Partial was that? Well, it was the pouring of the spirit. Yeah. And, and but the the blood red moons and the. Yeah, yeah. So when, so then, so then, when would that be fulfilled? And the tribulation, right? So again, you can see what, see how it's it's, mm. it's pointing to the tribulation. It's eschatological, and it talks about the great day of the Lord. So when is the great day of the Lord? At the end of the tribulation, specifically, the Lord comes. The when Jesus the returns, returns, right? Seven. When Jesus returns and he judges, so his feet hit the ground and it all split. Is judging, and we're, we're going to see later on in this uh, book. You know, it's a day of decision. What do we say about the day of decision? decision. The valley of decision. Whose decision is it? God's decision. So people say, you know, we're in the valley of decision. Now. Hey, I've got to make a decision. We, we hear a lot of older calls um, pitch that way. Oh, you know, you're in the valley of decision. Come forward. You know, the older call will make a decision for Christ. Oh, you know, yeah, yeah, I've heard it many times. Um, but it's not at all talking about that. It's not about you making a decision for Christ. It's actually. Gee, it's, it's God now making the decision over you. Is this one mine or not? That's, that's what that's all about. So what, what we see through this book is that it's pointing to, number one, it's pointing to the tribulation, but Joel is springboarding of actual events that are taking place in his time which are foreshadowing the things to come. Interesting, uh, Joel, the name Joel, what's it mean? 
Building no, God's no, Yahweh. Yahweh. Something God. Yahweh is God. Yahweh is God. I mean, yeah, yeah, Yahweh, Yahweh is God. And that's Yahweh interesting God. in itself. It's interesting in itself. That remember, throughout Israel's history and even, you know, within the church history, you read the seven letters of the churches in uh, Revelation 2 and 3. And, uh, and of course, you know, a whole range of other books, um, specifically the early church writings, you know, look at all of the, you know, the Gnostics coming in, etc. Throughout every age, we've, we've all shared the one problem, uh, whether it be Israel, the church, there's always one problem in common. What is it? Sin. What's that? Sin. Sin. But those who call themselves those who call themselves um, Christians or followers of God, you know, being being Israel for us Christians, followers of Christ. One thing. There's one thing in common for all of us. That we need salvation. Oh, we supposedly say, hopefully. But there's one thing. We, we drift, right? Oh. The, or the, the problem for Israel and the problem also for the church is there's, a, there's this continuous battle to, 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 to contend for the faith, to safeguard, to protect, to preserve the faith, to ensure that we are in step with some people's doctrine, to ensure that we're not entertaining anything false. We've got to make sure that the false teachers are kept on the outside and they're not on the inside, and doubly so to make sure that we're not teaching false doctrine. This has been a problem always, always for Israel. It's a problem for the church. We see specifically in the, in the seven letters of the churches. We see it throughout the church history. Um, same thing all the way through. We're going to see it in the tribulation. So always throughout the history, always throughout history, starting from the garden. So Adam and Eve you had the Satan coming in. There's always been a competitor. Always, someone's always competing for worship somewhere, somehow, trying to draw the people of God away from God and to entertain them with you know false worship to incorporate false worship it's wrong the way it starts is the way it will finish the way it starts and now here with um job we know that you know it's off the back so you've got daniel they've been released out of captivity for seven years you've got uh, then zachariah and haggai which would be also joel's contemporaries uh they've, they've got to go and rebuild the temple and of course they've been distracted and they, they, they're not get they're not um you know getting on with the program they're doing their own thing and Haggai in particular uh starting to fill their own pockets and god blows on everything that they do and so then the, the money falls through their um their pockets and and god says you know you, you do what i've called you to do and then i'll bless you do what you want to do and, and you know you're on your own kind of stuff and not only you're on your own but i'm actually going to destroy everything that you're trying to do to make sure you, you stay poor and uh, then, then with with um, Zachariah, likewise, and Zachariah, um, um, of course, it's it's loaded with um, prophecy. It's it's really very much pointing towards the uh, uh, the tribulation end days, uh, and then also the millennium as well. And so, God continually trying to keep them all back on track. Remember, in in, Zachar in Zachariah, uh, for the ones who did Zachariah, uh, we had the Bethelites who were coming in. Watch out for Bethel. Beware of Bethel. They were coming in, and they were saying all of this nonsense and uh and of course in the prophets have to sort of safeguard again you know to keep everybody on track and make sure that they you know they're holding fast to god they keep, they, 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 they're remaining consecrated this has been the problem all the way through and so that's really interesting with the name um um joel uh, yahweh yahweh is god so for israel you'd say it like this yahweh is the lord your god yahweh is the lord your god and we pick it up also in chapter 2 if you look at over in chapter 2 and verse 20 you see something of the same? Not 2 verse 20. Um, let's see if I can pick it. I'll put my eyes on it a little bit later. It's not there, though. Eh? It's not verse 20. That annoys me when that happens. I put down the wrong verse. But it says, it basically, um, um, Joel is pointing back to, to, to God and he's saying, you know, that God is your God. That God is the Lord your God. And, and God is God. And essentially, what he's saying is God is God and there is no other. And so you've got this, this um, um, competition always for worship, all the way through from the garden right through to the end. In the tribulation, of course, it's going to be, you know, much worse. You've got the Antichrist coming in, you've got the false prophet, you've got, you know, Jesus talked about the, the false messiahs, the false teachers also. Uh, many of those, of course, are, they're leading into, or they're deceiving people, conditioning people, preparing people for the tribulation to come, even this side, uh, the, the, the greatest sign, the greatest end time sign. 
Uh, is deception false teachers false teaching? Conditioning and preparing people for the ultimate false teacher who is the Antichrist. Paul talks about this specifically in uh, Second Thessalonians chapter 2. What's he say there, anyone? Who remembers? Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Chapter two. That he would restrain them, restrain them. That he be revealed in his own time. The lion's signs wonder that bit. Is that the bit? So yeah. So the antichrist will be revealed. Yeah. And and who sends the antichrist? Sorry. Who sends the antichrist? God sends. God sends him. God sends a strong delusion. So the greatest end time sign, because it's deception leading up to that, it says um, that many will fall away. Many will fall away. So before the Antichrist is revealed, many fall, many fall away. So the word there is um, apostasia, apostasia, which means apostate or apostasy. Uh, so uh, who is that talking about or what's that talking about specifically? The church. The church. So... What are they falling away from? The sound of the doctrine. So essentially what's happening is people aren't falling away from the church as in they're leaving the church, they're backsliding the church and they're going off and playing cricket or doing something else. Uh, it's, it's the whole church of denominations and movements are moving away from sound biblical doctrine. So they're still calling themselves the church, which is exactly what the Gnostics did. They still call themselves followers of Christ, or not necessarily of Christ, but they said they were in fellowship with God. So they still consider themselves to be saved. They still consider themselves to be in fellowship with God. Uh, likewise, as what Paul is predicting in the last days, before the Antichrist is revealed, it's going to be this great apostasy, great falling away. All the denominations, movements, and um, 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 churches are going to be moving away from sound biblical doctrine, still continuing to practice uh, religion, worship, rituals, all of that kind of stuff, but they're not known by God. God sends a strong delusion. God to, and the purpose of a strong delusion being the Antichrist is to separate one from the other, to be able so the, to the tribulations to test, to set the testing, sifts or shakes one from the next, and then of course God will have his select, his remnant, and the rest of course will, will perish. So that's and there's other many other verses talk about that and the, the um, uh, in the last days it's going to be doctrines of demons. In the last days, few will be able to endure sound doctrines. Few right will be able to endure sound doctrines. So they'll have itching ears. Uh, they'll be looking for teachers who can scratch those tickling ears. Uh, so they're, they're, they're acquiring teachers who are going to tell them what they want to hear. Uh, this is the tribulation. So this is leading in. This is leading in. So this is what. So what we're saying is, because there's always been a competitor against God, always. And 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 as we get closer to the day. Tribulation that's going to increase, so and we're seeing it now. Competitive can be us, so other people, all the enemy, all the spiritual forces can be three things: our, our own self will, other people. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll talk. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. Yeah. Talk about that in a, in a yeah. while. Yeah. Okay, so so it's interesting in, in itself, isn't it? So um, Joel's name Yahweh is God. So now he he is um, obviously he's pointing towards. Um, uh, a coming judgment, as we've already noted, but look over in um, so verse two, starting off, uh, he says, "Give ear, all inhabitants of the land, has such a thing happened in your days or in the days of your father?" So now he's talking about what here? What's happening? Judgment. You can see warning. Then something is going to happen. No, no, something is actually happening. He's so, so he's saying, "Hey guys, look what look look." Um, you know, we've got this mass plague of locusts. It's come in, and they're just they're just destroying everything. Has anything? Has anyone right. here? So he calls it together the the whole land. So that would be all of Judah, specifically Jerusalem, calling them together and saying, "Hey, has anybody here ever seen or heard of such a thing? Has anybody's father ever seen or heard of such a thing?" In other words. In living memory, has anyone seen anything like this? This is how devastating it is. First time it's happened. It's a, is it the first time? Well, no, it's not. It's, a, it's the worst time. It's, it's the worst. Locusts have happened before. For in living memory. Living memory. But what about, is, is there is there some other precedence for this somewhere else? The locusts in Egypt. Egypt. So, the, the, was it the night plague? Somewhere. And, so, so, and what was the purpose for that? Mm. What was the purpose? It was, that was actually that was a result. Yeah. What was the purpose? To get the uh, release of King, uh, just to let people go. Oh, we just flick over there. Exodus, 
Uh, I think it's uh, maybe 10, something like that. I think it's 10. Here it is. It's the eighth plague. X is 10. Note um, a couple of things. So we won't read it all. We won't read it all. Uh, maybe 16, verse 16 to 20. How's that? 16 to 20, who wants to read that? Then Sarah called Moses and Aaron in haste, and he said, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Now therefore forgive, I pray thee. Sorry, I'll just change the version. Sorry. Um, okay, so now therefore forgive my sin, please, only this once, and plead with the Lord your God only to remove this death from me. So he went out and Pharaoh, from Pharaoh and pleaded uh, with the Lord, and the Lord turn the wind into a, the wind into a strong west wind which lifted the locusts and drove them into the Red Sea. Not a single locust was left in all the country of Egypt. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and he did not let the people mm. in control go. The Lord hardened his heart. Yeah, well, he hardened his heart and his heart. Yeah, first, they, they, they the got yeah. Yeah. But what's the point here? What's the point? Uh, get, obviously let the people go. That, that's a, Repentance is also right. Yeah. Repentance. So that's always yeah. critical. That's always at God. Of course, we're very right. fair, right? It was very short last thing, uh, sadly. But, uh, but throughout the play, throughout the play, what you see is a, is, is a separation. It was even the magician said earlier, I think it was on the fourth play, uh, the magician said, this is the finger of God. So they, they could keep up with him yeah. up to the third play, and it was the fourth play, the, the Egyptians couldn't do it. I think it was the gnats. They couldn't do the gnats. And uh, <laughs> they said, that is just surely the finger of God. And so the magicians came to the, to, to the revelation that, hey, this is God. And, you know, none other can do this. There is, there, there is, this. This is God and there is no other. So you've got this competition, right, ongoing. To, to, un, until the fourth. And, there's a, no. and now Pharaoh, of course, he's resisting. But here, so you've got repentance is critical. It's always, it's always that the, God is revealing himself in a way that's unprecedented. Now, remember... All of the, uh, the plagues that we see here, so there are 10 plagues, we see them are repeated, all of them repeated again in the tribulation. And, this, and the point mm. here is again, is God is revealing himself in an, un, in, a, in an unprecedented way in order for people to call upon his name, to repent and to be forgiven and restored and renewed, reborn. So look also in verse um, 1. Um, Maybe one, two, two, one and two. Who wants to read that? What is it? Exodus. Uh, chapter, chapter. Joel. No, no. We are in Exodus. Exodus. Chapter ten. One and verse one and two. <laughs> yeah, let's go. Oh, and the Lord said to Moses, "Go unto Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the hearts of his servants, that I may show these signs of mine before him." And that you shall tell in the hearing of your son and your son's sons the mighty things I have done in Egypt, and my signs which I have done among them, that you may know that I am the Lord. Yeah. So, and so the idea is here, so that they may know that he's the Lord. Where, where do we see that phrase mentioned the most within the, the prophets? That you may know that I am the Lord. In the Gospels. There is, and the Prophets. Yeah. There, is one, there is one book in particular that stands out, Major. I'd say Isaiah. Isaiah? Isaiah? Isaiah. How much do you want to put on that? <laughs> oh, 20 bucks. 20 bucks? <laughs> oh, I love it. Oh, yeah. Well, you know. It's Ezekiel. It's Ezekiel. So with Ezekiel, it's, it's in every passage. And it's almost like it's in every few verses. And that you may know that I'm God. That you may know that I'm God. That you may know that I'm God. That you may know. It's just said many, many times. And I can't remember exactly. It's, it's said for 20 times. But it's but um, what's happening with um, Ezekiel? It's Again, it's, it's, it's judgment. And the point of the judgment is that they would know that he is God. So God is, it's, it's, it's shaking them. It's waking them up. 
Here, cop this. Here, cop that. Here's something else that you may not have God. Mm. Oh, you haven't got it yet? Okay, here's something else that you may not have God. In other words, I'm God and no one else is. No one else is and you're not. <laughs> Which, of course, was a problem for some of them as well. Uh, so you're not God and no one else is. But I'm God and I'm God alone. I think um, so Moses um, makes it really clear to... Uh, sorry, God makes it helps, tells Moses to make it clear to them before it happens so that they, they've got no excuse. Does that so it's like and, and also so it, and, and so God knew that would you know that they weren't going to respond so God was going to have to um, do what he said he was going to do and you'll see here that um, uh, so verse 2 and that you may tell in the hearing of your son and of your grandson how I dealt harshly with the Egyptians and what signs I have done among them that you may know that I'm the Lord so again the, the, the point of this is that the story is to be told and retold and told and retold and told and retold. So let's go back over, over um, Joel. So when we come back to, say, verse 2, Hear this, you elders, and give hear the inhabitants of the land. Has such a thing happened in your day or in the days of your forefathers? Well, yes, it has happened in the days of your forefathers, but these guys have not remembered. But what they're seeing here and now is not something that they've seen, you know, at any, any, any time within, you know, the, the immediate generations. But this is this is unprecedented for them, but it's not unprecedented in relation to the Bible. We've seen it before. But again, as like every every generation, whether, whether it be in Israel or the church, we forget. We see forget who God is and what he's done and da 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 da. But the point again is to bring us back into remembrance. So God does these things to bring us back into remembrance that he is God and there is none like him. Now the verse I was trying to find before is is uh, chapter 2, it's verse 27. Chapter 2, verse 27. And we see it here. So remember coming back to um, Joel's, the meaning of Joel's name is Yahweh is God. So who wants to read verse 27? I'll read it. Yep. You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and there is none else and my people shall never again be put to shame. Yeah, so God's in the midst and there is none other but him. So he's saying, this is, this is post now. So what he's leading to is post-tribulation. So the... Sadly for Israel, they have to go through the tribulation. There's no escaping that. They will go through the tribulation, and for, unfortunately, many who call themselves Christians today, who are sitting in church, uh, churches will also go through the tribulation. Who, who put them to shame, by the way? Never again will my people be shamed. Yeah, yeah. So that that will be the invading nations, uh, the invading uh, armies. Right, yeah, yeah. Okay. So there is, in, in particular, there is an invading army coming in. So we see it down in, um, say, verse six. For a nation has come up against my land, a power, uh, powerful beyond number, and its teeth are lion's teeth, and it has the fangs of a lioness. Uh, so this is a, this is an army. So what we're doing here is we've got this um, situation with this locust coming in. So we, first, first and foremost, so he's he's gathering everyone. So it's all the inhabitants of the land. Has anything like this happened before? Just tell your children that after they come. And then we come down to verse 4, which is interesting. So verse 4, it talks about the locusts. So look look at the way that um, uh, it's framed. You've got what the cutting locusts left, the swarming locusts has eaten. What the swarming locusts left, the hopping locusts has, locusts has eaten. What the hopping locusts left, the destroying locusts has eaten. So four times. What one's left, another's, another's consumed. And what, what, what that one's left, another's consumed. What that one's left, another's consumed. Now just stop here for a second. So um, Joel, he's dealing with a, a, um, a plague of locusts, a swarm of locusts. Not just one, but there's a wave of them, one after the next, after the next. And you think, oh, you know, this plague of locusts comes in, you think, oh, well, I mean, I see some damage. And, and, and then... Uh, Maybe we can re we, we can rebuild. <laughs> There's another plate coming, and then they smash the land again. Oh, that's oh man, that's oh that's terrible. Oh, we can but we can rebuild. We will unite. We can rebuild, and then another comes in and build back better. Build back better. Build back better. Yeah. Look, number one. Uh, Amos. Kept that in your backpack. In, <laughs> in that there, so there's four, there's four warnings. There's four impacts, four empires. Yeah. So in that one, and you've got obviously Syria. You've got, you've got four different sort of empires impacting that particular attempt to resurrect the Jewish 
existence. Yeah. So, so we're going to we're going to build on that. Okay. So yeah, you're you're good good spot. Yeah. So so go over to um just over the next book over is Amos. So just um to the right, just flick over to Amos for a second. Let me show you something. It's going to uh, it might surprise a lot of people. Amos chapter three. Who wants to read? Just um. Yeah, maybe, maybe uh, six and seven. That'll be that'll be fine. Who wants to read that? Six and seven. Oh man. Okay. Shall the trumpet be blown in the city, and the people not be afraid? Shall there be evil in the city, and the Lord hath not done it? Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. All right, so uh, uh, the ESV here, and in, in, in different translations read differently, but you know, it's interesting, it's interesting to read these, um, specifically um, 6b, uh, in a different translation. Does disaster come to a city unless the Lord has done it? So it, it doesn't matter where you read it, but they, all, all the translations, you know, they, they say the same thing. Uh, but uh, one thing they make clear, they say it differently, but one thing is made clear here is when disaster comes to a city, God's the one that does it. Remember, a lot of people will say, have, have a problem with that. And say, oh, it's not God. God would never do that. You know, da, 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 da. You know we think about, um, say, um, COVID. When disaster comes to a city, is it not God that's done it? He certainly allowed it. Absolutely he has. And that, so with respect to the locusts now, God's the one who's done it. God sent the locusts in. The, the, the swarms of locusts for the reason, for the purpose, to bring people to repentance so that they could be restored. The same is true now. He's, he's pointing, he's looking forward in relation to tribulation. He's looking forward in relation to tribulation. Same thing, judgment beyond anything anybody could ever imagine. No one's seen anything like it before. No one will see anything like it again. Uh, Jesus talked about that in Matthew 24, chapter uh, chapter 24, verse 21. Daniel says the same. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. Jeremiah says the same in Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7. There's nothing like this. Never will, never has been, and never will be again. Similar sort of language, so back to Joel, similar sort of language to what we're seeing here is, has such a thing happened in your day, or in the fathers, or, or, your, or on your forefathers' day? Has, have, have, has anybody ever seen anything like this? In living memory, does anyone know anything like this? Uh, does it ever happen before? Of course, we, we've already seen that it has happened, uh, but the They've got short memories. I've forgotten. Even though these stories have been told throughout the generations, I've got it written down, but they, they, they still, they forget God. And we, we can do the same. Look over in Joel also. Look at um, chapter 2. Now, so this is where it sort of springboards from um, the, the literal event. So you've got these, these lycus, these swarms of lycus, waves of lycus coming in, say, four, four times. And then we go over to this uh, next stage. So the day of the Lord is uh, chapter 2. And then we've got uh, in verse, um, say, 2, um, say, C, and it's talking about this army. It's a literal army. We see in verse um, 2, C. So it, talking about this army, it's a, it's a great and powerful people. They're uh, like it has never been before, nor will, it be, nor will it be again after them through the years of all generations. So again, this is, this is married up now with what Jesus is saying in Matthew chapter 24, so what Daniel said. Revelation. Yeah, it's it is. So, so now, so what he's done, he's using this natural plague of locusts to springboard from there. Or that's a, like that's a foreshadow of the things to come. He's using that. That's a literal, uh, a literal event. And then he's a, he takes that, and now he prophesies from, prophesies from that in relation to another event that's taking place. Now, at the time, it's the, the literal locusts. So this is where a lot of people get confused. They're literal locusts, but we've seen verse 6 here, for a nation has come up against the land. Now, chapter 2 gives us a really good explanation and description of what this, um, this, this army is all about. Where's this army from, you think? Asbestos. From east. Somewhere from the east. Somewhere from the east, you think? Uh, could be related to chapter Revelation 9, all that going on here. Oh, but oh, Babylon. Well, the, Cut the yeah. Is that? Are you talking about at this time, or are we talking about end, end time? This, no, this is this is a the prophesied army that's going to come up. Oh, the time activity is going to be beyond. 
captivity. So where, where, where do they come from? Where do they come from? Holy Roman Empire uh, revised Roman Empire. The revived Roman Empire. Revived, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Revived Roman Empire. Yeah, yeah. He thinks. I, th I think they're not physically men. Hey. I think they're spiritual. I think they're demonic. demonic. Yeah, oh, well, they're demonically inspired. Yeah. There's, there's no doubt about it. So I think there seems to be a pattern with Revelation 9 because there's two, like, if you look at 9, there's, yeah. there's the, the symbolism yeah. is very much the same. Yeah, yeah. But the first bit talks, seems like it's very like demonic. The second one seems it's like it can be more man. I sense that the demonic will go into the man that's 100 million they talk about. I, I sense that's the, the demons have to possess somebody, right? So they're not just going, yeah. Mm. So I reckon they're demonic. They're going to possess an army, Maybe. so it's the zombie apocalypse. In other words. Maybe, but I've, I've also <laughs> heard countering arguments even about that though too. Because yeah. what about the logistics of even trying to operate two hundred million actual men? Unless it is this, and this is another other theory about it as well, which is the hybrid well, that's army or whatever. The <coughs> I mean, just said that in nine sort of talks about the four angels, the Euphrates that. Let's the army come in. Do you want me to flick out of your memory? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you love this. Because you just, you just, just like, you just like throw the <laughs> idea out there and watch them spin, right? Yeah. Just do it. So, yeah. so Revelation 9 yeah. is, is a direct link. Yeah. There, there, there is a bit of a... Um, um, there's, an, there's an interesting verse here. It sort of throws a spanner in a work. It's yeah. certainly, it certainly burst my Bible. I'm not too pleased about it. Uh, verse 20. So chapter 2, verse 20. Who wants to read that? I will remove the northerner far from you. Stop. The northern army. The northerner. The so this army is from the north, which really is, is upset my theology because I've always said that, um, so specifically, Revelation chapter seven, that's that's an army from the from the east. So the kings of the king, kings of the east, which are picked up again in Revelation chapter sixteen, I've connected the dots, right? No, but that, but you're right. The, rip, the 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 army, the two hundred million, not the locusts. Now, uh, this is the other mistake people make. They, oh, locusts, locusts. You know, you've got the um, the mm -hmm. demonic locusts coming out of the pit. They've got the well, um, about, yeah, you've got a leader. A body on leading them. Oh, you don't we see natural locusts don't have a leader. Okay, so so like so the, so, the, so, so you've got so, so when when you read chapter two mm -hmm. along, and we will do this, um, mm -hmm. you know, in in the coming weeks, alongside chapter nine of Revelation. Specifically, a two hundred million man army, it's it's neck and neck. Now, the the issue here, of course, I always said two hundred million man army. They they they're from the east. They're, so you've got the kings of the east in, in Revelation. It's China, China, but it says clearly here. So it's up to my theology. I'm happy about it. If I could remove that verse, so. <laughs> because well, you know, I'm not stuck in the fall. Right in the fall. No, no, you remember. Remember. You're always learning, right? So 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 so, so, so it's. No, the Northern Army, right? So who's the Northern Army? Russia, 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 and that that could be that's close to China as well. You know, they could be the whole bunch coming over. No, I'm liking this. Keep 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 going. I'm just moving it closer back to the east. I'm like, well, it's it's not the same. It's not It doesn't say the far north. Yeah, yeah, it's the far north. It said, yeah, yeah, it's right. Well, well, in the northern up. The Hebrew there in in Ezekiel is further east. Further east. So that's Russia. That's Russia. Yeah, right. Russia and company. That's right. Yeah, and you also pick them up again in Daniel chapter eleven. So in Daniel chapter eleven, you've got the armies that come against the Antichrist. So you've got the Antichrist come. Flying back in from wherever, probably Europe, the God Roman mm. Empire, mm. flies back into Jerusalem, breaks a peace treaty. It kills tens of thousands of Jews at that time. So yeah, that's no no brainer. While well, a peace treaty is now broken, uh, so he's going up. So it's Egypt coming in at that particular time. So he comes flying in to defend um, his capital, Jerusalem, the temple uh, against them. They're coming in to, to plummet. Plumage um, Israel. So he defends them, he wipes them out, he takes a huge amount of wealth off them. So that's uh, um, Daniel 11. And then and then you've got two more kings that rise up. So kings from the east and kings from the north. So the kings from the east are going to be your, your China and Co. And kings from the north, that's going to be Russia and company, right? And so, But he can't beat that. 
He can't beat. He tries to beat him, but he can't. So this is Daniel chapter eleven. So the only one who can beat them is Jesus Christ. So they've met, they've met now together at Armageddon, Megiddo, for the big battle. For the big but battle, and that's been Christ. That, that little eleven, no, ten, ten, eleven. Sorry. Um, there's three Egypt. I remember now. Egypt. There's three nations. I remember. Go to it. That get subdued by the Antichrist. The southern nations. So they, they could relate to the three kings that are subdued by the Antichrist. You know, the ten kings, there's three that... Uh, there's so he chews up, he spits up. Sorry? He, he chews up, spits them out. There's three of them. There's three of them. There's yeah. Egypt. Uh, there's, yeah. so, uh, I don't know, there's three of them. I know there's... Uh, if you look at it, there's three. I, I actually maybe relate that to the three subdued kings of the ten, do you think? Mm. So that's all now leading to, to the day of the Lord. So, so specifically, yeah. so you've got the lead up to the day of the Lord, so you've got tribulation, all that kind of stuff. But the day of the Lord, specifically the day of the Lord, is when Jesus returns. So when he, when, and, he, and then judges. And you see it in, uh, so chapter 1, verse 15, we've got a reference um, to the day of the Lord. So, alas for the day, uh, alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is near, and the destruction from the Almighty it comes. So it's 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 near. It's now if Sharon was here, I'd say you know I'd remind her that it's it's near. It's very near. Just in a little while, it says in in um, um, Haggai. Just in a little while, Sharon. She wants. She's so desperate for the rapture. <laughs> yes. so it's near, Sharon. It's so near. Just, yeah. just hold on a little longer. Oh, okay. So let's go. <laughs> and then you see it again picked up. You see it again picked up in. Um, in uh, chapter 2 verse 1 blow the trumpet in Zion sound the alarm on my holy mountain let the inhabitants of the land uh, tram tremble for the day of the Lord is coming it is near mm. we see it again another reference to it in um, chapter uh, of chapter 2 verse um, 11 uh, same sort of thing the day of the Lord is great very awesome it doesn't mean cool and it means awesome, as in fearsome. So we change the word. Awesome, awesome didn't mean awesome. You know, in what we the way we use awesome now, awesome. That's a great dinner. It doesn't mean that. It means it means fearful, fearful. Uh, so it's very awesome. Who can endure it? Now that that's an interesting little um, end note to that uh, verse. Who can endure it? Who can endure it? Where else do we see that? Revelation. Where else do we see it? What happens? Us. Revelation six. Why don't we quickly flick over there? Revelation six. This is what this is what he's referring to. This is what's going to happen. So we can see in chapter six. So we've got the the seals. So we've got the uh, the four apocalyptic horsemen to start. To start, we've got the four apocalyptic horsemen, and then and then we've got the fifth seal, which is the martyrs. So and then we've got the sixth seal, which is what. What's it? What's it? Sky rolling back. Sky rolling back. Sky rolling back. Sky rolling back, and the face of Jesus Christ is visibly seen. He's coming back to judge. This is the day of the Lord, the awesome day. Who wants to quickly read it? So it's this, um, verse. Um, Verse 14 to 17. So, what chapter is this? Verse 14. Revelation 6. Verse 14. Then the scholar is seated as a scroll when it rolled up, and then every mountain in the islands was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, the every slave, every free men, hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks in the mountains. Mm. And said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. The great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Mm. So, picture this. Jesus Christ, sky rolls back, face of Christ is visibly seen. Yeah, opportunity still, we know from Zechariah chapter 12, uh, leading into 13 verse 1. It's still an opportunity, even at that late stage, for people to call upon his name and be saved. That's how merciful God is. But most won't. Most will want to go and hide themselves mm. in the cliffs and have rocks fall on their face and after that. And it did literally terrify. It terrified. And it says here at the end, the end um, uh, well, the, the um, final words here, the great day of his wrath has come, who can stand? Back to Joel. And we see again in chapter 2, verse 11, the end there for the day of the Lord is great. Same thing. It is very awesome. Who can endure it? Who, who can stand? This, this is a day like none other. It's a day like none other. So this is the day of the Lord. Now we've got um, another reference in um, chapter 3, verse 1, I think it is. 
no, 31 rather. It's uh, it's uh, it's 231, 231. Uh, so you've got uh, the sun should return to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. So again, the same thing. And then you've got um, also chapter 3, verse 14. 3, verse 14. Talking about the same thing, so it's multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Now, remember, we said before that is not uh, where we decide on Christ at the late stage. It's rather God now decides on us whether or not we are here. So all the way through this book, you see those, um, you know, those words just continually repeated. Zechariah, as we said before, is the number one for that. Uh, Jonah's the only book um, that doesn't have that. So. The whole point, again, the whole point of the tribulation and judgments, uh, the plagues, is to, to reveal Christ, to reveal God, rather, in the Old Testament, to reveal God, point towards their Messiah. For us, it's to reveal Christ, uh, specifically in the tribulation, to reveal Christ, uh, that people would, would repent of their sin, they would repent of their sin, they would, commit to, they would commit to God, enduring to the end, not enduring until the end, enduring until the end that they would be saved. The ones who endure to the end, those, those alone, only those, they will be saved. All right, so that's the that's point and purpose of it. So back to um, chapter 1. So we've got this uh, business, and I think Dan just sort of picked up on it a little bit as well. So you've got this uh, uh, way for times the uh, the prophet says you know the Lakers the Lakers the Lakers the Lakers you know what what the Lakers didn't do then they're going to do on, the, on, the, on this wave they're going to do on that wave what they what these ones didn't do on this wave the next one will do on what well, what's interesting what's in, what's significant about this um, group of four here why why four they all try to wipe out Israel they try to persecute wipe out and actually condemn and mm. not allow them to actually foster any sort of grounds for their land. Well, see, God at this time, at this, in, in this um, front end of the, the book, it's God doing it to get them back on track, to put them back in remembrance of their God. But, but four, judgments and four, is, is um, eschatological. So we know from Daniel, right? Daniel 2 and Daniel 7. So Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 are pretty close to being the same. So it talks about, say, so you've got the dream of Nebuchadnezzar, you've got the four kingdoms coming, or the, the one that is and the three that, that will be, and, and the one of the, the last which is, is the most interesting of all, which is who? Rome. Rome, for chapter 2. Follow it over to chapter 7, you've got four more kingdoms. Uh, who's the fourth in Rome? In, in um, Rather, in um, 7? Seven. Chapter 7? Greece. Rome is revived Roman in place. So it's a beast, right? The beast system. Right. So the beast system revived Roman so I was just thinking this about. kind of ties into Daniel then, where they talked Daniel. about the, the vision yeah. and the... Yeah. Um, so so something Empire. else is very interesting about that. So so you've got the Antichrist who's going to... So the one world nation, new world order. Um, one, world, one world order, rather. One world order, new world order. Uh, Antichrist is going to, he's the one who's going to lead that. So he will be the, the one world leader of the new world order. He will lead that. So you've got the you've got Rome, but, but then in the tribulation, you've got the revived Roman Empire. Now, for again, so take, carry it through, still speaking astrologically, what, what, what else is in, a, in groups of four? The, horses and the, the four horsemen, right? So the Antichrist is the first, the, the white horse. So that's in Revelation 6. Where else do we see something of that um, in Scripture? The fourth temple is actually... Is four temples total? There will be four temples, yes. Yeah, so you've got the Millennial Temple, which so should be the fourth. So what else do we see? So does that mean the third one will be... Tribulation. Destroyed? Tribulation, yeah. 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 Oh. Not, not yeah. Not Where was that? Yeah, it, well, well, it will be just for when Jesus comes back, so you've got the 75 day interval, and within that time, so this is talking about, this is um, now Daniel 12, he okay. will destroy everything that followed, right everything and everything planned. Exactly, exactly. Okay, I mean, that's that's the situation too, because Daniel Just good. stay with this for a second, all stay right, far. Right. So, yeah. all right, apocalyptic <laughs> <laughs> horsemen, apocalyptic horsemen. So, so Zechariah, right, Zechariah chapter 1 talks about the what? Four. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, four yeah, horsemen, and then and then it's picked up where else? Colors, but they're similar colors. Where else? 
in Daniel uh, in, in, uh, Revelation no, 6. No, 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 yeah, we said, or you said Revelation 6. Yeah. In Zechariah, yeah. we're asking Zechariah, is it picked up again? Yeah. No, no, it's chapter six, chapter six. Oh, it's chapter six as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, so you've got the, you've got, you've got the chariot. So you've got the horsemen. You've got the chariots, yeah. which is, of course, the, the still the apocalyptic horsemen That's in right. Revelation six. But you've also got the four, four craftsmen in, um, in, in um, uh, Zechariah chapter one. So four craftsmen, which are the four nations that are going to come against Israel. So you can, so can you see this? It's, so it's the, 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 the locus are literal. These are not pointing, they're not, you know, in any way, um, uh, they're, they're not going to be fulfilling prophecy in relation to what we're talking about. But you can see how God oftentimes uses four. So it's going to be a judgment of four. And, and they're combined. With those four locusts, it's, it's obviously four of AD or BC. So he's looking back at the four as well and saying they're the four nations that previously like four. No, 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 no. So, just, no, so that's not con to be connected that way. Not no, to no. Be, be confused. Yeah. I'm just saying it's interesting. You've okay. got this, oh, okay. so you've got this wave of four yeah. locusts coming through, yeah, cool. but often time eschatologically, yeah. you can see there is groupings of four. Yeah, so also, so within the, uh, so you've got the four um, um, horsemen or four, uh, the apocalyptic horsemen in, in chapter Six of Revelation, so the seals, the first four seals. Mm, yeah. But in in chapter seven, verse one, mm. Revelation, it talks about the four angels eyes. holding back four the four eyes. winds. Yes. Now, if you take those, if you take that back to Zechariah, mm. the four horses or the four chariots are also called winds, which are also spirits. Mm. It's all connected. Yeah. It's all connected. So it's, that's just an interesting thing, you know. Why four? Why four waves of locusts, etc.? No, it's not not an exact. It's you know, I'm not trying to say it is, but it's just it's just interesting that you use four, and we know that four is very very much eschatological. Mm. It's not a judgment because obviously it's forty days, forty nights, forty years. All of that, yeah. and, and forty means testing. That's what it means. Mm. Testing. Yeah. Okay. So so we've got these locusts, as we said. So they've destroyed everything. So what's this? I'm just that's deep. <laughs> so we've got these locusts that are cutting in, and 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 they they're going to destroy everything. So so this is and this is also interesting. Pulling back to the day of the Lord, remember what we said last time about the day of the Lord. And, um, Amos picks up on it in particular. So Israel thought that hey, oh, we're the apple of God's eye. You know we you know we're the chosen nation, and we can you know we can do whatever we want. You know we kind of get a green pass. You know what? Well, they uh, still that way. Yeah. Now. <laughs> so anyway, so so and they but they were saying so, and Joel picks up on it also. But God is going to restore Zion, right? So the Jews have always been of that mind. That one, they thought that when Jesus came in, right? Jesus was going to come in. He's going to overthrow the Romans and he was going to restore uh, um, um, Israel and all that. Put them on the holy hill. He's going to rule them around and da 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 all that. Mm. So of course, when he didn't do that, they didn't like it. So they they rejected it. But the Jews have always thought that, that their Messiah is going to come and he's going to overthrow everyone else and he's going to, you know, Israel's going to be the center of the world and he's going to rule and reign from there and they're going to rule and reign alongside him. Which is how they were deceived. So, this is it. So, so, so now, now, this is what God is doing here in this passage. You know, like Pope does it in, in um, um, Amos. Look, look over here. So, this is, again, we're still talking about the day of the Lord. God, God is bringing some correction to some of their some of their thinking. So we see in chapter five, Amos chapter five, verse eighteen to twenty. He wants to read that. We read it last week. Just good, good uh, refresh on. We just talked about the four so the waves of the locusts is coming in. So basically, hey, if if you escaped, if somehow your crop escaped what this 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 lot have done, well then you know then you're going to get smashed by the next lot. And if some chance, and by some chance that that's you know, you've escaped that, then you've got the next light and da 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 da. So, 18, uh, Amos 18, chapter 5, 18 and 20. Yep. Well unto you that desire the day of the Lord, to what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light, as if a man did flee from a lion and a bear met him, on or went into the house and leaned his hand on the wall, and the serpent bit him. Shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light? Even very dark and no brightness in it. Yeah. So what he's saying there, that, you know, you, you guys, you Zion, you know, you, you, you Israel, you think, hey, you know, you, you desire the day of the Lord because you think that's when Jesus is going to come back. Well, they, and the Messiah is going to come back and he's going to put them, in, you know, on the holy hill and they're going to da da da. da. But he's saying, yeah, no, no, no. Now what happens is on that day and leading up to that day, you become. Uh, <laughs> 
No, no, well, they've always been deceived, always been deceived. But you become the focus of my attention. So it's you that's going to get smashed. You're going to get smashed before everyone else. You get smashed. So instead of um, God saying, I'm going to put you on the holy hill and you're going to rule and reign the world with me, alongside me, no, before then, you're going to get smashed. Because, because you have refused to obey me. Well, going back to you, well, even before then, so, so Joel, well before then, that they've just refused to follow God. And they've done it all the way through. And ne it's never changed. And interestingly, so here, Israel's going to be in the tribulation. Israel is, fr is first and foremost front and centre. The, uh, the nation. What's that? They're, 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 they're going to be the focus. They're going to be the number one focus. So to get them saved also, and then others will get saved through them. Now, Peter says something also very interesting, like this in 1 Peter. What does he say there? 1 Peter chapter 4? 1 Peter chapter 4. Let's click over there. So we're reminded of Romans, and, and as you're finding your way there, we're reminded of Romans in chapter 11, where Paul is talking to the the church and he's saying hey you guys you know Israel got cut off they were the natural branch and they got cut off he said, don't you be so smart don't you both because if I cut off the natural branch I'll, I'll also cut off you the wild branch is being grafted in and then he goes in so chapter 11 verse 22 note the kindness and severity of God kindness of those who remain severity to those who fall in other words, what he's saying is if you do what they did, I'm going to treat you in the same way. So there's no free pass for you and as, as there was no free pass for them. They're temporarily, temporarily cut off, temporarily blinded. But in the tribulation, I'm going to remove those, those uh, blindfolds, those blind, they, they're going to see and they're going to come to faith in droves. First, starting with 144,000. I've, I've got a running theory, though, too. I actually think that the initial awakening of, of Israel is going to actually happen with uh, God stepping in with Ezekiel 38-39 though. Well, all of that. Well, that's, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. a matter of, we don't know the timeline yeah, yeah. of all of that either, but yeah. it's it's just kind of like, I just get the sense that it's just yeah. like, yeah. whoa, what was that? Yeah. And, oh, that's that's but, and again, yeah. all of these things, so the, 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 the Gentiles essentially are the instrument of God to bring about yeah. salvation for the Jews. Remember Jesus said in Matthew 24, he said, talking to the Jews, you're going to be persecuted yeah. unto death. Yeah. You guys, you guys are going to get smashed. And in the Revelation right. chapter 6, they get smashed. Revelation chapter 12 in particular, Satan's thrown to the ground. He's, he's going after them in great wrath. He knows his time is short and he's trying to, he's trying to wipe out the Jews. Why, why is he so desperate to wipe out the Jews? Because the, well, what's the interesting covenant gets a little dissolved actually. You're, you're, so, so you're on the main. So, so Jesus said, so when they rejected Jesus, when Jesus came into Jerusalem in, in Matthew chapter 23, verse 39, Jesus said, because you've rejected me, because you've rejected me, you will not see me again until I say, blessed is he comes in until you, until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Until they come to that place, which they do in the tribulation, after they've been smashed. So they get smashed in the tribulation. realizing that they crucified their own Messiah. I can't even begin to imagine. Well, just how imagine that even the be. people who back then, if you were one of those people, but and he finally died. Here, you're like, but here's, 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 well, Paul, Paul himself, when he was yeah, you know, that's uh, right. So yeah. he, he's a, he's a um, he just a, so it, it's very easy. It's very easy for us as a church to say hey, 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 Jews, which is exactly what Paul did in Romans. Uh, so in chapter one, Romans. Uh, you know, Paul says, you know, look at these Gentiles, these idiots, you know, da, 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 da. You know they, they've exchanged the truth for a lie, you know, they're worshipping creation instead of the creator, da, 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 da. And, then, uh, and, and then the Jews going, yeah, 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 these idiots. And, and then, then chapter 2, he goes, yeah, you're no different. <laughs> so yeah. it's him. And then in chapter 3, he goes, actually, none of us are any better. <laughs> We've yeah. all fallen short. You know, we're all, we're all in the same yeah. sinking boat. So don't you stick the finger in them, at them. We're all in the sinking boat together. In other words, we are all accountable to God. And, and in Romans chapter 14, verse 12, I think it is, he says, you know, every one of us will be held in account, in account to God. Every one of us will answer for good and for bad. So, so we're all in the same situation. And, and so we said in the tribulation, in the tribulation, um, first and foremost, it is Israel. 
that is going to get Absolutely. going to get smashed. But then also other nations do, specifically those who try to help the Israel, those who who who, who um, um, reject the um, the Antichrist, all of that kind of stuff. You know, as so they go against his rule and reign, so they're going to get hit as well. But the church also, so need to need to keep this in mind. A lot of people lose sight of this. Oh, we're in the age of grace. Yeah, okay. Read over in um, so. Um, 1 Peter, 1 Peter it is, um, and um, chapter 4, 1 Peter chapter 4, and we see in, um, say, why don't we start with verse 7, who wants to read verse 7? (laughs) But the end of all things is at hand, therefore be serious and watchful, and watchful in your prayers. Mm. Yeah, the end of all things is at hand, now read verse 17. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God, and it begins with us first. What will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? So the judgment of God begins in the household of God. So it begins first in the household of God. What do you think that this means? Well, those who are leaders and the pastors, they cop it first. Con- so, so the context of the passage, two things, two things. We haven't got time. We, I'm, I'm, I'm moving quick now. Uh, we were only about halfway through the notes, but but um, you guys talk too much, see? You ask questions. It's supposed to be that way. You ask too many questions. It's supposed to be that way. So, so the context, the context here is 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 twofold. So, so the wider context is so the judgment, the judgment right for the household of God is through persecution, it's through persecution. So. Through persecution, the church, the true church, is being tested. Are we truly committed to following Christ? Will we remain when when the going gets tough? Mm. But there is also, so we haven't got time to read the passage. Read the passage, that's your homework. Uh, You'll see that. It's persecution. So as Christ was persecuted, we likewise follow in his footsteps. We take up our cross and we follow him. We count the cost. We count the cost. Mm. We go by the narrow and difficult path. There's persecution. So we are, we are judging ourselves. In fact, Paul says, judge yourself. Judge yourself that you do not be judged, be judged by any other. And then he goes on to say, this is in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, he also says that um, the church is to judge each other. Mm. We don't judge the world. We've got no business judging the world, but we do judge the church, mm. which goes, which go, which goes mm. against, of course, yeah. judge not least you be judged. That's completely out of context. Mm. Jesus says that in Matthew seven, and straight after that, he judges the Pharisees. <laughs> he calls them dogs. <laughs> so mm. there is a judgment. It's like, so yeah, we are to judge. We judge the church. We don't judge the world. The world's already under judgment. We judge ourselves first right. and foremost, and as a church, we judge. It's, we, we judge each other specifically in light of doctrine, right? Doctrine and deed. So the next part, so this, we've been judged by the world, so we, we, we hold fast no matter what comes at us, whatever, pers- persecution, death, trial, whatever. But then, secondly, we're judging ourselves. So in other we're judging our human passion. So our, we, we would want to go off and do the things that aren't in step with God. We judge ourselves and we say, hey, no. We won't do it. now by doing that. So that is a judgment. So the judgment of God starts with the household of God. Now, if there is one or if there are those who are going against God, then there is other judgments also. So Paul talks about this also in Corinthians. So some are even dying, some are sick because they're not that they're taking the communion unworthily and so on and so on. So there is a judgment. God will judge. God starts with the church. So this side of tribulation, God is judging the church. Now, for those who continue. But don't respond to, to the God's correction as judgment. This side of tribulation will wake up on the other side of tribulation. So the ones who reject God, who mm. are see, who are, um, are grieving the spirit, who are searing their conscience against God, mm. this side of the tribulation, we see it through the letters of the um, um, in the, in the um, uh, book of Revelation, the seven letters. Uh, there are two churches doing well. There are five doing doing badly. So that seventy percent of the church is not going well. And Jesus is to each of those seven, those five churches failing. That He's going to take something from them, and what He takes from them on each, on each occasion is significant of salvation. And He makes it really, really plain. The church of Thyatira, I'm going to sp- I'm going to throw you. I'm going to cast you into the Great Tribulation. He says it very plainly with the church of Sardis. Likewise, I'm going to come in an hour that you do not know, like a thief, and then. 
I'm going to war against you. So I'm going to come, I'm going to take my own, my church, and then I'm going to war against you. You're in tribulation. He says to the church of Lacedaemon, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth, which is a direct quote from uh, the Old Testament in relation to uh, Israel going into uh, a, um, we, we, uh, the promised land. And if they inter interact or intermingle with the outsiders, he would vomit them into out, out of the land and into the territory of the outsiders. So they would become one with them instead of no longer being consecrated. So consecration means separation. So no longer being separated from the outsiders, but rather vomited into their midst, which is a grim tribulation. So first and foremost, God judges the church. This side of the tribulation, those who fail to respond to that judgment, they get a second mm -hmm. opportunity in the, in, in the tribulation. So, sorry. They will be very sorry. So back to um, our, uh, our passage. So we can see now, so, so the, the angel, uh, the, no, angel, the, the locust army, locust army here, that uh, it's, it's a literal locust army that destroyed everything, verse 4. And now we've got this, um, this uh, verse 5, Awake you drunkards and weep, and wail you drinks of wine, because of the sweet wine, for it's cut off from your mouth. Now that's not a verse to say you can't have a drink. No. <laughs> It's, they're not paying attention. So, so these guys are caught up in all the trappings of the world, right? So they're, they're comfortable. So the, the harvest is great, it's bountiful, they're celebrating, this is a great time, you know. So they, they, so essentially, they're no longer focused on God. They're, so, they're, they're very much caught up in the world. Go over to Luke uh, chapter 21. So Luke chapter 21 is um, um, known as the Olivet Discourse passage. So you've got three... Um, chapter three, three books to pick up on the all of it. This course is Matthew 24, which is probably the most known. Matthew 13, Mark 13, and Luke 21. So Luke 21, it finishes like this, verse um, 34, talking to now um, to the followers of Christ, and, and this would be, you know, carried through to the church. This is in the end time. So this is before, before tribulation, before tribulation. But watch yourselves. Watch yourself. So he's just talked about all the things that are going to happen leading into the tribulation and, and the things in the tribulation. But watch yourselves. Lest your hearts be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the cares of this life, that they, they will come upon you suddenly like a trap. So the day is tribulation. The day will come upon you suddenly like a trap. So verse 35, um, For it will come upon all who dwell on the face of the whole earth, but stay awake at all times praying that you may have the strength to escape all of these things that are going to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. So this is, this is talking about the rapture. So, verse 34, watch yourselves, watch yourselves, and we see in also in um, verse 36, stay awake. Now back to Joel, so it's the same thing, the same, right? Running to the church. So we've got the same stuff here, awake. In other words, watch yourselves, stay, you know, wake up, guys. You guys are so caught up in the things of the world. So what Jesus is saying, Matthew 24, uh, Luke 21, rather, is he's saying the guys who are so caught up with the, the things of this world, they're caught up in drunkenness and dissipation. Who, who knows what dissipation is? Dissipation? Dissipation. dissipation. What? Abundance. Oh. They're just caught up in the things of the world. They're loving. So the more, the, they, the more of the world they have, the more, of the, world, the more likely the world they become. There's nothing wrong with having stuff. Just don't let that stuff have you. So... They, they become so worldly that they lose focus on God. God becomes sort of a, you know, something that's in the, in the, in the back of mind type thing mm. until, unless, until they need him, which is what happened mm. with um, Lamentations. Lamentations is a cracker. But Jeremiah warning um, Judah for, for decades, uh, you know, to, to turn. And that they were rejecting the, the warnings of Jeremiah. And, and then, of course, you, 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 you read about the experience of what happened when God came in through Lamentations, and it's actually it's quite sad. You know, they start off thinking, oh, maybe there's hope. You know, we got smashed. Oh, you know, we brought this on ourselves, but we didn't listen. Uh, maybe there's hope. Maybe, you know, God is loving and kind and merciful and compassionate, slow to anger. He's <laughs> quick to forgive. And then, and then it goes on. Uh, you know, I don't think there's any hope. <laughs> I think we're cooked. And, and then, of course, then, you know, later on, Jeremiah 29, 11, you uh, know, I think probably one of the most well-known and oh. and, and uh, misquoted verses in all the scripture, and it says Jeremiah twenty-nine eleven. 
Prosper. I know the plans you have for you. Yeah. Says the Lord. Says the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not harm you. Yeah. <laughs> that is you. not a verse for me to say, John. Uh, God would have, but um, you know, He's got a great plan. That's just, that's just, that's just, John, I think He wants you to have a mansion with a boat, very big. Yeah. You know, it's not at all that. Awesome. It's all that generation. They be Israel. Do the rubber. They've been so smashed. They've been smashed beyond any hope. Beyond any hope. So they're smashed. They're in. They're in. They're in Babylon, the place of sin. Uh, they, they've had their everything taken from them. They've lost the things that they've put their confidence in, which is the land, the tour, and the temple. All gone. They've even had their names changed. Their names are connected to God. Now they're in this place. They're in this dungeon. They've got nothing. They've been smashed. You know, they, their family members have been killed. Their kids have been killed. Their wives have been killed. So the, the few that are left, are the, they're in Babylon. They're sitting there going, we didn't listen. We smashed. So this is now Lamentations, right? We, we're done. We're cooked. We're, we're finished. Is there any hope? And now Jeremiah sends a letter in. He's still over in Jerusalem. Sends a letter in. And he says, ah, for now I know. You know, the, the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Yeah, plans for good. And that's the plan. It's a prosper. In other words, yeah, you're going to be here for 70 years because you didn't listen. <laughs> I'm going to bring that. you back to your land. But, like but guess what? I'm not done with you yet. Yeah. It's like the, it's like the, you know, the... Got the, the, the drunken guy who's like, or whatever, who's lost his, lost the plot. There's only one way up. Yeah. Like so this is, and, and this sort is exactly. Thing. So this that story mm. is going to be repeated mm. in the tribulation, and so where, where people are finding themselves in the tribulation, I think, hey, you know, I'm done. I should have listened. I didn't listen. I, you know, I knew the stuff. Mm. And, and this this movie that's coming out called Left Behind. It's it's very much that. It's a pastor mm. that didn't listen. Mm. He was, he was teaching and preaching, but he didn't really believe. He finds himself in the tribulation, and he thinks he's cooked. The whole point of the tribulation is to get your attention. It's a wake-up, and it's exactly what's going on here. Now, wait. So, so Joel says so Joel, Joel says to the people, hey, have you seen anything like this before? And, and, and he could be thinking, yeah, yeah, he goes, yeah, and seen nothing yet. <laughs> this is just like, this is just, what's to come will dwarf this so many times over it's not funny but here but he's using this as a means to be able to bring, get their attention we saw from amos and it's also quoted in, in um, isaiah and again in, in jeremiah that when disaster comes to a city god does it and the purpose of it or the point of the purpose is to bring about restoration that's the whole point just a very good question do you think that sort of thing can happen now before the tribulation, because, uh, I mean, have you heard I know, of COVID? I know it's a massive Did you see this? Did you, did you come across this thing called COVID? It's been around a couple of years. I know, I know, I know. Yeah, just, and I agree with you. Like, 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 I'm talking about New York, all these well, things. Well, like, well, hold on, hold on. Because I'm getting I don't know. I'm getting money growing soon, for example. So, bird pain, right? I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I want to touch on this real quick yeah. too, just being the American in the room. I mean, we, there's a lot of people I follow. They're all kind of like, is this going to be a revival or has America passed the Rubicon? I mean, they're all kind of speculating on, is this the end? Because again, they all know that America pretty much is not a force to be heard of, uh, biblically speaking, in yeah. the end. Look, it's attention yeah. through this. It? Well, so it, be... well the, the, and that comes yeah. back to what we talked about before, right? So it's going to be a new world order. So a new world order, for, for a new world order to be, uh, then uh, we, we, in international relations, right? So, so any student of international relations uh, understands that um, America would be considered to be the hegemon of the world, right? It's, it's, it's a regional hegemon, it's not a global hegemon. So when Ryan was around, for instance, that was considered to be a, a, a world hegemon. So a, the, the hegemon, so not, not regional, just a hegemon. Right, Rome. right. And, 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 and the four nations leading up, say, say in Babylon and Greece and, and, and so on. So, so you know, Persia, Mesin, they were considered to be hegemons, right? So they're the ruling powers. Now, we've, we've never seen anything like that again since Rome. America's the closest to it. America's the closest to it. But for the new world that will come into place, America's still big enough now. Now, within international relations, um, um, any student of international relations would say that. Um, um, China is fast catching up, fast catching up to America, and will at some stage overtake. But now, when you look at that from an international relations perspective, that would be right. But when you look at it from a biblical perspective, no. So the ten nations, ten toes, ten kings, that'll be the next hegemon. But for that hegemon to come into play, and that will be a worldwide hegemon, and there's been none like it since Rome, so therefore it would be the revived Roman Empire. 
America has to be bumped off. I, that's what I mean. So yeah. 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 That's my point. Talk to me afterwards, like because I have a lot to say on this. Especially because it seems like there's going to be a judgment somewhere. Yeah. So America actually. has to be bumped off yeah. for that to happen, and it mm. will. And Australia, Australia. will get bumped off. No, and Australia doesn't write. We're nothing. They don't. It doesn't even write. We're not even a bleep, bleep yeah. on the radar. Well, yeah. we, we couldn't defend Tasmania. No, seriously. <laughs> actually, the. Yeah. And, and what would you want? Like, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm just kidding. Have you ever been there? Oh, yeah. No, I'm just oh my a, a very friend of mine's down here, so it's, we have a joke. Okay, so back to this passage, we'll, and we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up. We'll wrap it up real quick. So again, you know, we've got this. We've got the situation where, where Israel, you know, they're in, they're in a time of sort of you know prosperity. They, they, they've got everything they need. They've got the bounty. They've got the, you know they're drunk on the on the on the um, on the on the produce. And they've got plenty of food, and plenty of plenty of wine, and all of that kind of stuff, and they're celebrating. But what God does here now is he flips it. So we can see in verse 6, so he's, um, Joel, he's bounced from the literal uh, locust army, and now he's still starting to head towards this, this army of men. This is a nation now coming in. And so he's saying, what the locusts have done here is going to happen again through this other army. But as we go further into the book, we're going to see it's far, far, far worse. Like the locusts, what they've done is bad. And so the result of what the locusts have done, as we see in, say, verse 5, Say verse five, no Joel, verse five. Awake you drunkards, weep and wail. Weep and wail. This is a terrible thing. So instead of drinking and celebrating and laughing, it's weeping and wailing. We take it over to verse nine. Uh, lament like a virgin. Uh, we see again over in verse. Um, uh, so that's verse eight, brother. I think I said nine. Uh, and then verse nine. The priests mourn and the ministers of the Lord. So, so, so you've got this weeping and wailing, you've got this lamenting, and you've got this this, this mourning. So replace. So you've got one on one hand, you've got the celebrating, the drinking, the laughing. Now replace. This is this this is how it is now with the locusts, and it's going to be far far worse when this, when this army comes in. Look at the um, interesting verse eight. It talks about um, uh, lament, uh, lament like a virgin wearing sackcloth. So. Uh, virgins wear well, generally in, in our time anyway they, they wear white right they wear white gowns and, and so so trading for the white gown to the for the sackcloth now the, 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 there's, there's a lot of symbolism here so metaphors is what uh, Joel's using so remember so so what he's doing is he starts with the locusts and we'll finish we'll finish up with this so he bounces from the locusts and he's using that as a metaphor, if you like, for this army that's coming in. We're going to see it, and we, we, we've said we've already seen it come from the north. Chapter two really sort of narrows in, on the, and, and here they are. Gives us a great description of them. They're super soldiers, essentially. But then so there's a few more metaphors that he that he's um, that he uses here, and uh, so specifically of Israel, um, he calls them a um, a fig tree, or refers to them as a fig tree, and a, well, the, the, he talks about a fig tree rather and a vine. So that's symbolic of, of um, so we see in verse 7, um, talking about splintering a fig tree and, and, and um, throwing down the branches, etc. And there is a verse there, he talks about the vine. Verse 12. Verse 12 is a vine. So so that's symbolic of Israel. So there's mm -hmm. metaphors being used there. So in the same way, in the same way the fig tree and the vine is being destroyed, well, likewise Israel, who is the fig tree and the vine, is mm -hmm. going to be destroyed. Jesus talked about that. Basically called, and, 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 and they're mentioned numerous times throughout the, uh, specifically Jeremiah, uh, the useless vine. They're the useless vine in the barren fig tree. That's Israel. And because because of their uselessness or their faithlessness, they're going to be smacked in the tribulation. So what the, what the locusts have done here, literally, is what God's going to do to them in the tribulation through through this army. We see also an interesting couple of words, um, or a couple of verses that are linked up. In verse 5, we see how the wine is, is cut off from their mouth. And we see further over in... Um, uh, in verse 9, the grain offering and the drink offering are cut off from the house of the Lord. The word there for the Hebrew there for cut off is it's like snatched violently out of your hand. So just as you're taking, as you're going to take the drink, it's just violently snatched out of your hand. Mm -hmm. and, and so what the picture is there again, it's, it's hit them suddenly, unexpectedly. So they're having the drink, they're having the celebration, they're having the food, they're enjoying, they're laughing, da da da, da and then bang, all of a sudden, mm -hmm. 
catches it, which would be very much like what the rapture and then whoa this next thing you know you one minute you it would have been somewhat similar in the um the holocaust wouldn't it you know those world war Two. one minute you know the jews are enjoying their uh their, you know their nice homes and prosperity and all of that kind of stuff the next thing you know everything's taken off from take just out of nowhere you know the germans come in they invade they they snatch everything away from them and they march them off to the to the camps etc so this will be a lot quicker than that but again it catches them out big time so there's some interesting words to to uh, pay attention to uh, look also at verse 11 and we're moving fast so verse verse 5 we've got this um you know awake you drunkards and then be ashamed O pillar of the soil so what happens is here is and so, so again, they've invested everything into what they're doing. You know, they're, they're so focused on the land, they're so focused on building. Uh, um, Haggai said the same to, um, to to the people of his day. You know, instead of building the temple, they were they're too busy building their own houses. Uh, but they do it all for all in vain. So whatever they try and do, God blows on it, and and it, and it comes to nothing. So the same is true here. So let it uh, um, be ashamed of the tiller of the field. In other words, everything you've invested in, everything that you've built up for yourself, everything that you've had confidence in, everything that you value, everything that you that you treasure, is going to be taken from you. Which is why Jesus said, "Don't just up your your treasures here, but rather in heaven, because everything here is subject to what." Decay, destroy, robbers, whatever. It, so you can lose everything here can be lost in in a nanosecond, which is what's going to happen mm -hmm. here. It's that snatching away. Well, all of the time that, that you spend investing in whatever it is you are doing, it can be taken from you in a nanosecond. And so you, instead of pursuing God, you pursue worldly things, mm -hmm. and because you pursue worldly things, you don't have God, which is what Jesus is saying in Matthew in Luke chapter twenty-one. What's that? Do not hold fast to this this world that's right yeah mm. yeah so again finishing off so basically verse 12 everything's going to be destroyed everything's going to be destroyed so this is a warning to um to to israel first and foremost but as we've already seen uh it's also it should be a warning to the church so the church to make sure so first and foremost we're judging ourselves the world is judging us uh but and, and it also says in, in peter make sure you read it um, um one peter chapter four that the world is surprised the world is surprised when we don't do what they do. So that in a sense is a judgment. Right? So the world is saying, hey, come and do what we're doing. Come and have the party. And da, 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 da. It goes on to say that they're already judged. They're, they're, pre, they're, they're judged, so, you know, they're, 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 so they're pre-judged, but yet the judgment is yet to take place. But they're surprised when we don't do what they do. So you've got the, pro, you've got the persecution. You've also got the, the, you know, the, the test or the challenge. You know, do we want to go and continue to do what they do? Is it okay? You know, da, 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 da. we're going to go against God. We're going to, you know, just, oh, you know, God is mine, which is what, of course, Israel did and um, Judah did and many of them in the church do as well. Grace, grace, you know, God will come on the grace. We can do whatever you know, we, we like and it'll be all right. So there's that judgment. And then and then through that, denying the will, we judge ourselves. So that you've got that judgment as well. So the, the, the church is likewise being judged. But the church is like, but, but the, the, the letter... Uh, the book of Revelation is first and foremost to the church. The first two chapters addresses the church. Thereafter, um, after uh, the first, chapter two, verse chapter three, thereafter, it, 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 it addresses the Jews. The point. So those first, um, those two chapters, two and three, addressing the church, waking the church up to say to the church, you better judge yourselves. You better repent or else. If you don't repent, guess what? I'm taking. Yeah, yeah, I'm taking something from you, and the something I'm taking from you is symbolic of salvation. If you don't have that, you're in a tribulation. You're in a tribulation for the purpose of salvation, restoration. So the message is the same. The message to the Jews is also the message to the church. Great little book, isn't it? And we, we've just, we've only just, we're just skipping across the surface here, really. I'm glad you just skipped. Let's go see the skip and pass. Next week, next week we're going to have a look at uh, so the, the response. So we, we've seen the problem. We've seen the problem, right? So here's the problem. You've got the, these locusts coming in. Da, 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 this is going to be far worse. The thing, the things to come, tribulation. The response. This is the required response. Is a call to repentance. Again, you see the heart of God. You see, it's the same as this, you know, when you say to your, your child, you know, if you do that again, I'm going to smack you. Don't do that, I'm going to smack you. I don't want to smack my child. I want my child to stop doing what he's doing so I don't have to smack him. But if he keeps doing what he's doing, I'm going to have to smack him. And the point of the smack is not to destroy, but to save. Same. It's exactly the same thing. You see the heart of God in this. 
And so don't miss that part. You know, they can call up for all of us. You know, the, the doom and the gloom and the you know the, the hell and the horror. It's not about that. It's, the, the, the book of Revelation, I'll say it like this: there's, there's more hope than horror. Although there is horror, but there's still more hope. The point is restoration. Mm. I never, never lose sight of that. All right, guys. So um, it's going to be great with the book as we. You know, I reckon we're probably three years in, in this one. <laughs> well, if you keep talking like that, it will be. Oh, that's pretty quick. Yeah. Maybe two years. I was going quick. I was going, I was going quick. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, so, why don't we... Uh, do we have, are we doing communion tonight? No. Anyone? No. no. Okay. All right. Um, so, why don't we... Um, guys online, thanks for watching. Um, you're welcome to join us. Uh, any time, I won't say in the flesh, I get in trouble when I say that, but in the person you can join us uh, um, in Broadbridge was just contact me online, so uh, until next week, God bless. Alright guys, um